Welcome once again to our Bible walkthrough where we will be looking at and hearing about what the Bible has to say about different aspects of life. And today as we walk through the Bible we'll be hearing from Pastor Bob about what lessons the life of Moses has taught him for his life. The Bible says the word of God is alive and powerful and so a little later we want to invite you to pray along with us a powerful scripture into our lives about being led by the Holy Spirit. And we have another great song from Rebecca, one of our worship leaders. But first, we will be looking at another one of the many questions people ask about the Bible and about following Jesus. So we'll start with the question for today. So Reginda, what do you have this time, please? The question is that are attempts being made internationally for abortion to be classified as a human right? What does the Bible say about abortion? Well, before 1967, in the UK, abortion was a criminal offence. But since that time, it's been made legal. And the argument for it at that time was that it would prevent what was called backstreet abortions, which were illegal procedures which put women's lives at risk in the process. And it was claimed that the number of legal abortions would be few. The reality is somewhat different. Since 1967, in the UK alone, over 8 million abortions have taken place and that's currently running at over 200,000 a year. So before we look at the Bible, let's consider why abortion is being carried out on such a wide scale. It's now the cause of the majority of deaths worldwide compared with any other cause of death. And the reason people embrace the theory of evolution is not because it's a proven fact. It certainly is not. But it gives people an excuse to dismiss God and the Bible and, of course, the morality of the Bible. The Bible teaches that the intimacy of sex is reserved for the sanctity of, uh, and the security of marriage um, between a man and a woman and not outside marriage. So if God can be removed, so can the Bible, so can God's values of sexual morality, and people can make up their own rules and behaviours they choose. So this has enabled people to separate sex from the intimacy and lifelong, a lifelong commitment of marriage and indeed make it what it has now become, an idol that has become an object of worship. What then follows unbridled sexual activity, as surely as night follows day, is the problem then of unwanted consequences, uh, unplanned pregnancies. So abortion is seen as the answer. Babies are an inconvenience. So what does God say in the Bible? When God took Moses and the children of Israel into the Promised Land, he spoke of the activities of the, the Canaanites at that time, upon whom his judgment was going to fall. Israel was not to be like the Canaanites, especially when it came to their unrestrained sexual activity, which was similar to the way the world is becoming right now. They practiced completely unrestrained sexual activity, and they killed their babies by sacrificing them to their god, Moloch which was completely abhorrent to God, as he made clear. So when God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, the Sixth Commandment was, you must not murder. And prior to 1967, abortion was regarded as murder of an unborn human. So those in favour of abortion have sought to justify it by saying, the fetus is not a human being, it's just a collection of cells. But as time goes by, even that argument goes out of the window, when calls are being made for abortion to be allowed right up to birth. The Bible makes clear two important things. First, that every human being is unique and is created in the image of God. And that alone gives him or her the highest status and importance. The seriousness of murder, God made clear, was that it takes the life of someone who is made in the image of God. And secondly, Psalm 139 describes how God knows every detail of each person with absolute intimacy. So, uh, Psalm 139 um, verse 13 says you made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb and this includes uh, his involvement in the formation of the baby in the womb and Psalm 51 makes clear that life starts at conception and not at birth just because something is legal by the laws of the land doesn't make it right or moral laws in past times that were regarded as acceptable then such as putting children to work up and inside chimneys or in factories with dangerous unprotected machinery are now regarded as abhorrent. 
And I'm sure that if time permits, in generations to come, they will look back on this period of history with the same abhorrence as we now look back on slavery in a previous time. Can abortion be forgiven? Well, it's not the unforgivable sin. And if a person is truly repentant, they will be forgiven. But remember, repentance includes not only being sorry, but also wanting to change, and so turning away from the behaviour that God says do not practice. So what Bible verse are you now going to lead us in to pray in over our lives? The Bible verse is from Romans 8, verse 14. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. But first, let me read from Romans chapter 8, verse 1 to 14. It says, So now, there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving Spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his body, his son, as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us, who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things, but those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So, letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws, and it never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to Him at all. And Christ lives within you, so even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. When we repented and trusted in Christ's finished work on the cross for the payment of our sins, we were born again or regenerated by God's Spirit. Just as a child becomes a part of an earthly family at birth, we become part of a spiritual family when we are born again. In the spiritual family, we are sons and daughters of God, God's children. Being born again is a gift of salvation. While all people born are God's creation, they are not His children. Not all are His children. Only those who have put their faith and trust in Jesus, who repent or turn away from their sins and ask His forgiveness. Then inviting Jesus Christ into their lives and Saviour and Lord of their lives, they become born again. They are born again. The Holy Spirit comes to live in them, live in us, and we are given a new nature to live our life for Jesus. Our new nature wants us to walk with the Holy Spirit, but we also have, a, have our old sinful nature in us, which will fight to overcome our new nature. 
we have to put down our old nature whenever it tempts us to sin so we live a holy life for Jesus. We grow in our new nature through reading and meditating on God's word and praying to him daily, having a daily communion with Jesus. We can talk to Jesus in any time and that is what the Bible calls pray unceasingly. When we have sinful thoughts come into our minds that we know are not right, let's bring those thoughts and align them with God's word. If they are not right, we stop thinking of them or we reject them or they will take root in our brains and become strongholds to those wrong thoughts or patterns of thinking. The Bible calls us to capture every thought and make it obey Christ. Those thoughts, they cause us to sin and grieve the Holy Spirit of God. But we ask the Holy Spirit of God to change and transform our lives by changing our wrong thoughts, wrong thought patterns. We depend on the Holy Spirit to lead us as his children. Let us now pray this prayer over our lives based on the passage of the Bible and on Romans 8 verse 14. All those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. Please join me in prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you for saving me from all my sins. Please help me to live my new life for you. Help me to walk in my new Holy Spirit nature and to put down my old sinful nature. When temptations come and when wrong thoughts come into my mind, please help me to reject them and replace them with your word so they don't take root in my brain. May I always walk in the assurance of my salvation knowing that I am now a child of God, saved and bought with your own precious blood shed on the cross. Amen. Now we're going over to Rebecca as she sings how nothing else but Christ will do for us. And that will be followed by Pastor Bob as he reflects upon how lessons from the life of Moses can impact us today.
my friends. This evening we're going to look at another huge, immense, important Old Testament biblical figure, Moses. Moses was born in a culture of difficulty, captivity. The story begins in Exodus. His parents were from the tribe of Levi. It was a time when the Pharaoh that had been kind and friendly to the Israelites, suddenly turned round and didn't like them anymore. The children of Israel were growing and growing, outgrowing and outperforming in many ways the Egyptians, and they felt very threatened by them, not only because of the different culture, but because of the different God. And the Egyptians ordered that all boys would be killed at birth. They ordered the midwives of the Hebrew women to, to kill every child that was a boy because they didn't want the tribe of Israel to grow anymore. But fortunately, the midwives were godly women and they said, well, the Hebrew women deliver before we get there. His early life was fraught then with danger. How were the parents going to Look after this boy. How were they going to hide him year after year? How were they going to provide for him? And after a while, they made a little raft of straw and put it upon the Nile. He lived a dangerous life. He shouldn't have lived. But God had plans for this little baby. I wonder whether you realise the plans that God has for you. Not just now, but the plans that he's always had. I was born many, many years ago in Chichester, Sussex. I was in very straight and difficult circumstances. I had a very difficult life with foster parents and with other situations. But 
In the midst of all that, I came to know Jesus as a little boy in a Salvation Army citadel, as they call it. I didn't really know what was going on. But I learned about Jesus. And it's amazing how through the years you can see how God brings you back. I was taking back to my mother not long after that. And I had very, very difficult times. And I lived away from God, not having remembered the early years. But God knew what he was doing. And God knew from the moment that Moses was conceived, if not before then, that God had a plan for him. All of the things that would happen in his many, many years of life. God had a plan for Moses. So often we think we have to do everything. We need to plan everything. We need to sort things out. But when you give your life to Jesus, you can lay down those burdens, those cares, those worries, those responsibilities and listen to God. Moses shouldn't have lived, but his mother put him on this little raft as it were in the river Nile and coincidentally or was it coincidentally or maybe God brought Pharaoh's daughter down to the river with his with her maid and she saw this little boy floating along bobbing along in the water and she took pity upon him and took him home into the palace and brought him up as her own child that seems a great story. But that was just the beginning. That was God making sure that Moses just stayed alive. But not only that he should stay alive, but he should grow up in a palace, in a different civilization, in a different culture. And that would stand him stead through the many, many decades and the call of God upon his life. The Lord looked after him. And Moses' life had very many different stages. I don't know about you, but somebody of my generation, thinking of Moses, would think of somebody old, big, with a beard. Well, really, we'd be thinking of Charlton Heston in the old films. But of course, he wasn't anything like that. He was a little child. He'd grow up with the best of things, probably the best of food, while his parents and his, and his own nation of Israel were struggling. Slaves to Egypt, he was being educated by the best teachers of the land. He was being fed, he was being looked after, he was being clothed, he was being taught in every way. I would imagine that this young lady that rescued him lavished love and attention upon him. But then came a day when he grew up instinctively somewhere he knew that he didn't belong to the Egyptians, although he was growing up as a prince. He knew that he belonged to this enslaved Hebrew Israelite people. We read in Hebrews 11, that chapter of Faith heroes, that he, he could have stayed there. He could have lived a life of luxury. He could have had everything. He could have had the equivalent of the, the best chariot, the Ferrari of its time. But he chose to suffer with the people of God. See, that's what faith is about. Faith isn't just about getting the collectibles, the bigger house, the bigger job, the bigger car. Faith is walking step by step, day by day with Jesus. Believing the word, trusting God, seeking the Holy Spirit, being filled with his power. And Moses could have lived a, a great life, but he went to see the Hebrews and he made the mistake. He saw an Egyptian man bullying a Hebrew and he intervened and he killed the man. Oh my goodness. The different stages of Moses' life. At that time, he was about 40, so I believe. And then he ran away because he knew that Pharaoh would have him killed for murder. And he ran away into the desert and he met a family there, a priest and his daughters. And the priest invited him in and he became a shepherd. From a prince to a shepherd, what a huge drop. And he married one of the 
daughters. And so for another 40 years, he's in the wilderness. He'd started off uh, as a child, then he became a prince, and then he, he, the princeness got to him and he became arrogant. Instinctively, somewhere he knew he was Israel's deliverer, but he tried to do it himself rather than go in the footsteps of God. He'd become arrogant. He'd become proud. He was waited on. He was adored. And now suddenly he's on the run and he's in the desert. God had brought him there. This wasn't the devil driving him out of town. No, no. This was God taking him in through his different stages in order to transform him. And maybe you like me, have gone through different stages of life, stages of joy and happiness and plenty, and then stages of difficulty and tragedy and hardship. So many people blame the devil. I believe that God is in control. I believe that God has seated Jesus in a place that is higher than all the principalities and power by sitting him in, on his own right hand. I believe that my hand is in the hand of God. And through that time of difficulty, that time of wilderness, that time of challenge, that time of hardship, God was using that time to make him the man that he needed to be. And that is the same case for you and I. Maybe you're going through difficulties. Maybe the job hasn't worked out. Maybe the ministry hasn't worked out. Maybe the marriage or the whatever hasn't worked out. And you're thinking, what has gone wrong? Why is this happening? Maybe God is using it to transform you. Maybe God is using that sickness to come into your life and, and get your attention. But in order to change your character sometimes, and often we need to have difficulties in our lives. And God worked in Moses to give him humility. Almost from a prince to a pauper to give him humility. And God referred him later on as being the meekest Man on earth. But oh my goodness, didn't he go through difficulties? After 40 years, Moses had become so meek, so humble that God met him in the wilderness, in, in, a, in, a, in, in the burning bush story. He's walking along on his daily walk and he's hearing his name, Moses, Moses. And he looks and there's this bush burning, but it's not being consumed with the fire. It's supernatural. And God starts to speak to him. Reveal who he is and start to say to him, I want you to go back to my people. Yeah, your people, but they're my people. Because the thing we have to remember is all of this, all of our Christian lives, ministry, it's not about you and me. It's not about... Anybody, this is God's plan. This is God's purpose. This is God's power, God's strength, God's will for my life and yours. But by that time, Moses had probably got a, bit, a little bit overcooked with the humility. And he said, I want you to go and tell him, hang on a minute, if I go back, I'll be killed. And God said, no, I have a plan and a purpose. I want you to go back to my people. I want you to deliver them. I want you to speak them. I want you to tell them that God still loves them and that God will deliver them. And that however the circumstances seem, however bad it is, however difficult it is, salvation is near. Deliverance is at hand. God is going to rescue you. But unfortunately, Moses said, I can't do it. I can't do it. It's not me. I can't do it. But God then had to bring his brother. Aaron into the fold he said okay you tell Aaron what I'm telling you and he will tell the people 
But God warned Moses, he said, it's not going to be straightforward. This is not going to be easy. You just need to trust me that things are going to seem to go wrong. There are going to be difficulties. People will turn against you. Pharaoh will not believe you. But just keep trusting and believing me. I'm going to get you out of here. I'm going to take you into the promised land that I promised Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. We're going to go to that promised land. So eventually Moses went there. With his staff, his stick. And he went and he told the people of Israel, great news guys, God is going to deliver us. And they all said, way, praise the Lord, or whatever they said in those days. Moses went to Pharaoh and he started to say, you need to let God's people free. Pharaoh, the most powerful, fearful person said, I'm not going to do it. And we know maybe the story of the many, many things that happened. He supernaturally put his staff or his stick on the floor and it turned into a snake and he picked it up. God is a supernatural God. God will call you. God will show you where he wants you to go. But you need to remember that we are a supernatural people. And after many year, times of difficulty, Moses led the people out, but not before all of the firstborn of Egypt. The children, the cattle were slaughtered, but God set up the blood covenant. He said, put the blood over the door. It was a foreshadowing of the blood of Jesus. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. Moses led the people out, millions of them. There were 600,000 men and women and children. He led them out. You'd have thought, that's it. But he led them in a way where he knew they would be stuck at the Red Sea. Pharaoh chased them, but in their fear, they howled and complained. But God came and turned the Red Sea back so that the children of Israel could escape. Moses went on and he made mistakes. Yes, he did. He got angry with them when the people complained. And actually the history of the children of Israel, they complained and they complained and they complained. But eventually Moses went up to Mount Sinai and brought the tablets of stone with the Ten Commandments. And still the children of Israel rebelled. And that was the story of Israel through the wilderness years. Moses himself got annoyed and lost his opportunity to lead the people into the promised land because he got angry with them. And you see, it wasn't his place to be angry with them. He was merely the mouthpiece of God. And we need to remember, my friends, that we are here to serve, but we are the mouthpiece of God. We are to bring grace and joy and salvation into the hearts and lives of people. Yes, there's so much more to that story. And that he was the really the foundation of the Jewish law. He is so well thought of by the Jews. But the important message is that God guided him. God called him. God led him. God kept him. God empowered him. God anointed him. Through the many difficulties, God gave him wisdom and guidance. Well, may the Lord bless you. As you continue on to follow the Lord, may the Lord bless you as you read the word and read of the heroic people that are in there. But know that God wants you to be filled with the Holy Spirit. He wants you to love him more and to follow him more. God wants you to be the people that God wants you to be. He doesn't want you to be somebody else. He wants to be who God has created and called you to be. May the Lord bless you. So thank you for joining us this time with our Bible walkthrough and we look forward to seeing you next time. You're the rock on which I stand.